morning, everybody. I'm Craig. I'm one of the elders here, and you know that they're desperate for music leaders when the preacher's the music leader. <laughs> Such is the, the state of affairs on January 1st. Happy New Year. Um, I'm old. I went to bed way before midnight, and then I couldn't sleep because I'm old. So um, I want to make a quick announcement. Uh, I'm going to make it all this month because we really want to emphasize it as, as elders to you all. And the basic gist of it is this, you're going to hear it a lot, is we want you to become a member here at Christ Community. Um, we're, we've taken some time to really think about what membership means and what it doesn't mean and what it'll mean for all of us going forward. Um, if you're not currently a member, this is, your, this is your invitation to come and join us. Starting in February, I'm going to teach, I think, three classes back to back to back, um, kind of highlighting the statement of faith and then... Um, the vision, mission, purpose, history of Christ's community, and then another class. What does it mean to be a member? Why would it even matter? What does the Bible have to say about membership? What kind of expectations does the church have of you? What expectations could you, should you as a member have of the church? Um, just really explaining what it means to be a Christian connected to a local church community. We want to really try to make that something serious and something formal and something that means something around here. So, we hope that you'll consider that. Consider this your, your invitation to become a member here at Christ Community. I'm going to leave it at that. I know there's some holes there, probably some more questions. We'll get to it. And if you have any specific questions, you can always come and talk to me. But I do want you to know that you are, we would love for you to become a member at Christ Community here. I would love to hear um, what books you read in 2022 that were some of your highlights um, I'm not a prolific reader. I do enjoy reading. I will say that my world expanded in 2022 with uh, audiobooks from the library. I'm really thankful for that. Um, and one book that I, got to, that, I, that I got to go through was a book called Everything Sad is Untrue. You've probably heard me mention this one before. It was one of my favorites of 2022 for sure. Um, Daniel Nayeri, I think I'm pronouncing his name right. He, he's the author. He immigrated to the U.S. from Iran as a young child with his mom and his sister, and that was many years ago. The book itself is a memoir. Um, it's a story told from his 12-year-old perspective um, of leaving Iran and then what happens after that. What stands out um, above it all throughout the story, and then really is the highlight for me as I read it, was the testimony of, of his mother, Sima. She was successful in Iran, she, she was educated, respected. She was a devout Muslim at the center of society, and she encountered Jesus. And just like one of the disciples of old, she met Christ and then laid down her life and followed him. And for her to convert to Christianity in Iran at that time, but really even still today, was not only unthinkable from a social or a societal or a familial, or a financial point of view, all those reasons would make someone hesitate at following Christ, it would get her killed. It was a death sentence. And so as the secret police in Iran, this is many years ago, closed in to kill her, she took her children and left everything. And she bounced, as refugees do, from country to country, her and her kids from country to country, finally gaining asylum here in the United States. In a recent interview, after all the heartache, loss, difficulties, here's what she said when she was asked whether it was worth it to lose nearly everything to follow Christ. She said this, nothing matters. The kind of job, how hard it was, nothing matters. No, definitely worth it. Definitely worth it. I would do it all again. Definitely worth it. Definitely worth it. I would do it all again. It's 2023. Happy New Year. I don't know if we've mentioned that a few times. But for me, a new year, like Jordan mentioned actually at the beginning, it's a reflective time. Something that, I, that I've been reflecting on and something that I've been fire, finding I desire more and more, both for me and for you. Something that I see in SEMA is resilience. I see the, the difficulties that many of you face. I talk to you about them. I pray for you in them. I, am very, I encounter various trials in my own life. 
And maybe it's like a post-pandemic thing too, after we've encountered something really hard. I want to be, I don't know, resilient to the things that come at me in life. I find myself desiring more and more a resilient faith, a faith that will, that will weather the storms of life. So here's my question. How does that happen? How do we have the kind of faith that stands through the toughest trials? We were singing a little bit about that this morning. The type of faith that, that sees the truth in the midst of, of so much that's false around us. The type of faith that, that withstands the storms. And not only withstands them, but shines in the darkness. A type of faith that, if, if you think about Seema's life and her escaping Iran, that in the face of pressure, and persecution, and problems, finds joy. Not just makes it through, but actually has a joy about them. How do we have that kind of resilience? How will we be resilient in 2023? That's the question I'm asking. Now, I've started a bit of a tradition here at Christ Community um, to, at the very outset of a new year, this sermon, if you go back a couple years, um, I talk about one key spiritual practice that over time will bear the most fruit in your life. And that is reading God's word. That's what I want to focus on with you this morning. As we think about resilient faith, resilient faith going into 2023 and God's word. Here's my catchy little phrase. I, was, I know the kids were going to be here today, so I thought we'd do a little sing-songy thing. I'm not going to make you sing, but here's my catchy phrase for 2023. It took me all of 30 seconds to figure it out. In 2023, more of God's word in me. All right? In 2023, more of God's word in me. That's what I hope you take away. I hope if you, maybe if you can't remember anything else about this sermon, you'll remember in 2023, more of God's word in me. I hope that this sermon today really stokes that fire in you. In 2023, more of God's word in me. Psalm 1, that we read just a second ago, gives us the key to resilient faith. And here's what we're going to see. It's going to be on a slide right here. Here's what we're going to see. First, we're going to see the enemies of resilience, the delight of the resilient, and then the result for the resilient. Let's ask for the Lord's help. Let's pray together. Lord, we just set this time in your hands. All time is in your hands. You, who had no beginning and you will have no end, look down on us right now and bless us. Bless us from your word. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, come and do your work. Thank you for 2022. Come help us start 2023 well. Shape us and mold us to be more like Jesus through your word, by the power of the Spirit. Amen. All right, so here's the first thing we're looking at, the the enemies of resilience. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to keep it open to Psalm 1. Psalm 1's a really important psalm. It opens up really the entire Psalter. That's all 150 psalms. Gives you an introduction. I want to talk more about that. We're not going to hit that today. Here's what I want to do with you right now. I want to read the first two lines again, two verses again. It says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The whole book of Psalms, one of the richest parts of all scripture, often quoted, often used, often remembered, often Spoken in the best of times and the worst of times starts with this word. It starts with blessed. Blessed is the man. Blessed can be translated happy. Happy is the man. Many, many centuries ago, the queen of Sheba heard about the grandeur and the beauty and the splendor and the majesty of King Solomon, especially his wisdom. She traveled with riches beyond imagination to meet him. She went into his courts And she witnessed all of it firsthand. And then she exclaimed in 1 Kings 10, this is what she said, the report about you is true. Happy, blessed are your men. Happy, blessed are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. That's what she witnessed. Everyone who's who's in your presence, Solomon, is, is happy. They have what they need. They get to hear your wisdom. They're safe, secure, full, satisfied, blessed. You have all you need or you want. 
how is the Psalm 1 man that it starts with happy or blessed? Well, it says this. How are you going to be blessed? Blessed is the man who does not walk, stand, or sit with those who are living and speaking contrary to the ways of God. This is not an exhaustive list. This isn't like, okay, I can apparently go running with sinners because that's not on the list. That was a bad 2023 start to my jokes. You can't, you, it doesn't mean that you just can't go running with them. What it means is stop giving so much of your time to the ways of the world, those apart from God. The wicked, sinners and scoffers are enemies of the invincible, resilient happiness that God promises. So what's the lesson here? The type of living that stands the test of life, which is what we're going to see later on in the psalm, this tree that bears fruit, right? The type of living that stands the tests of life, that has indestructible joy, that true happiness, the happiness that's in the courts of King Solomon, that type of life does not give prime placement to the teaching and influence of those who don't follow God. They're enemies of that kind of life. People who walk, stand, or sit in the way of sinners, they don't do it. I'm talking about me and you now. People who stand, sit, walk in the way of sinners don't do it because they feel like they need to. They do it because they want to. How does that happen? Well, I talked about this last year at, at, at this time, and I'm going to mention it again. Um, the reason I'm mentioning it again is it actually does come up occasionally in my house, and I found it to be a really helpful paradigm for talking about the influence of the world on our own lives. Um, and I want to show it to you. It's actually a picture. It's going to be up here on the screen. It's the Wisdom Pyramid. This is a, this is a graphic and a book actually written by a guy named Brett McCracken. Um, I encourage you to read it. It's very good. The whole idea is this. Many of us in grade school grew up hearing about the food pyramid, right? You have the, you know, whatever's on the bottom nowadays. I don't know. Some of you are gluten-free. I think it was grains on the bottom. I'm sorry. And then like dairy and meat and all that kind of stuff. And at the very tip top is your junk food, right? The ice cream, candies, sweets, things like that. If you want to eat a healthy diet, you want to be a healthy person, you eat more stuff on the bottom and you eat less stuff on the top. Okay? Okay. Now, this is the wisdom pyramid. What is your mental diet? What is your wisdom diet? You can see there on the bottom, the Bible. Then local church is next, nature and beauty books. Believe it or not, Twitter is on the very tip top. It's your junk food. Hard to believe. I know. The studies say that this pyramid for most people is inverted. It's flipped upside down. That most, most likely you are standing in the way of sinners by spending more time in those top two tiers of the internet and social media than in that, that bottom level of the Bible. What does the Christian that's on that inverted diet look like? Well, their life can be described as one full of discontent and flimsy when the storms of life come. In a word, unhappy. Unhappy. Maybe you can identify with that. I was actually talking with my, my family on a drive. I was just, just remembering this right now. We were talking about social media, the impact of social media on my own life. Um, one of the reasons that I left the majority of social media was because of how unhappy it made me, discontent it made me. On top of that, to be perfectly frank, I have heard of far too many stories recently of people whose faith is crumbling. If we don't take this, our diet, what goes into our heads and our hearts seriously, we will not stand. We will crumble. You're not impervious to this. You're not better than that. We will not be happy. We will not be blessed, like it says in Psalm 1. I was rereading Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship, recently. He he makes a really compelling argument that I want to share with you. Sometimes as Christians... We obey because we believe. And that makes sense. We're motivated by our head, by our thinking, and by our heart, our feelings, and then we act that out, right? Our head and our heart lead to our hands. 
our thinking and our feeling lead to our actions. That makes sense. But he also makes, Bonhoeffer makes a really strong case why often it's our actions that must lead the way. Not our thinking and our feeling, but our actions first. We must obey, and then that brings belief. Now, who calls us to obedience? The person that calls us to obedience matters. Psalm 1, who's telling us to not stand, sit, or, or walk in the way of sinners, that call is given to us by God. This is the call of God. The opening of the greatest songbook ever written. And so what I'm inviting you to believe today is to reject the seduction of the world. And I am also not only inviting you to to think that way and to feel that way, on the authority of God's word, I am calling you to obey that, to do that, to live that, to take action in 2023. So now here's the question. How do you not give way to those enemies of resilience? How do you not stand, sit, or walk with the influence of the world? What does that look like? Well, let's start here. What is one influence in your life right now that needs to be reduced or even eliminated? Think about that. Think about your diet. What is one influence in your life that needs to be reduced or eliminated right now? Maybe it's big, maybe it's little. I thought about this for myself for a little while, and I think for me, an influence that I want to eliminate in 2023 is Twitter. It's hard for me to even say it. I love Twitter. I do. Uh, it's not because I tweet. I don't. I, I may have tweeted once many, many years ago. Um, I love it because I read about sports on Twitter. But I've since got interested beyond the sports world and what's trending or what Elon Musk is up to today. And the problem is my mind will fixate on that. It fills my mind with, honestly, junk food. It has overtaken me. And verse 4 of Psalm 1 says this, The wicked are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Jesus, when he ended the greatest and the most famous sermon of all time, the Sermon on the Mount. He ended it with a story about a man who built his house on sand and a man who built his house on the rock. If you allow the influence of the world to come in over and over again, if I allow it to come in, if we allow that to come in day by day, you are, I am, building my house on sand. It, our house, namely you, will not last. When the storms of life come, we will be blown down. We will find that we've got nothing but husks and ashes. Here's what, here's what Psalm 1 is, is telling us at the very beginning. We've got to be on guard. We have to be on guard against the enemies of our resilience, the enemies of our indestructible joy that we have through our relationship, through Christ, with God. And this happens Not suddenly, it doesn't come upon us, whoa, and we're knocked off our course. The crumbling of people's faith, the faith that I see crumbling around me is not just suddenly overnight, it comes incrementally. It's a drip, 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 slow drift off course. But the loss is unspeakably great. So be on guard against the influence of the world. Be on guard against these enemies of resilience. What will you eliminate or reduce in 2023? That's my question for you. Here's number two. Here's what we see. The delight of the resilient. Verse two. Look at verse two again. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The blessed man, the happy man, goes again and again to the refreshing well of God's word. That's what we see. Day and night. As long as the Lord allows me to be pastor of this church, year after year, I intend during this sermon to exhort you again and again to go to the well of God's word. Take it to the bank or hold me accountable if I don't. I want you to do whatever you can do to get it into your life. 
I want to do whatever I can do to get it into my life. This is for me too, believe me. Write it on a sticky note, stick it to your computer, put it on a lock screen of your phone, memorize it with your friends, with your family, read it, listen to it, do whatever you can to make it part of your life. And if you're in an MC, I know many of you are, listen up, listen. Darcy and I were talking yesterday, Darcy's my wife, Many of you know her. Darcy and I were talking and we realized one component that we have lacked traditionally in our own personal Bible reading is community and accountability. We, wanted to, we, we realized, man, we need to read with other people. We need that, that, that relate, those relational qualities, that community, that accountability that comes from others that we're in relationship with. So you know what we did yesterday? We reached out to our MC. We just put up a message on GroupMe and we said, hey, uh, I, I want to do this. I don't even really know what plan I want to do, but does anybody want to do it with me? And the response was so encouraging just to hear people say, hey, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm in on that. And maybe some people are thinking about it. I'm not like trying to shame the people in my MC who didn't respond or anything like that. I'm just saying it was, it was a great thing to see people respond to, the, to what I felt like God was putting on Darcy in my heart to read in community. It also sparked a great conversation with my kids around the table. If you're in an MC, Think about that. Think about reaching out to somebody else. If you're not an MC, think about reaching out to somebody else. It's good to read God's word in community. Read the Bible together. You know, the action that we see in verse 2 is, is an action of meditation. Meditating on God's word. Which is really what I mean when I say, put God's word in you or get it in you in all these different ways. What does that mean? What does it mean to meditate on the word of God? Well, when I, when I say that, what comes to your mind? For most, it's a, it's a picture of the Eastern religions, right? And the little hmm and the fingers and this thing. They, they, you know, when Eastern religions, when they try to meditate, what they're trying to do is they're trying to empty themselves. They're trying to empty their mind, make themselves completely blank. The reason that they make themselves blank, I, I believe, if I got this right, is because they're trying to open themselves up to like the unknown universe. There's like a, a, a personless universe that's going to speak to them. I actually think that um, emptying your mind is p- impossible. Um, it implies that we're a blank slate and we know that, in fact, we are um, sinners from birth. So what is Christian meditation? Christian meditation is this. It's something that's mentioned throughout the Bible. Um, the Puritan Richard Baxter wrote a book about this. He described it this way. He said, what you do is you fix your mind on a particular truth in the Bible and you speak to yourself about that truth until God draws near. That's the way that he... So it's not about emptying your mind. It's about filling your mind with the right kind of truth. You fix your mind on a truth from the Bible until God draws near. In a sense... It's taking the truths of God's word and pressing it on that truth into your heart until it catches fire, as one person put it. Push it into your heart until it catches fire. That's what Christian meditation is, a truth from God's word pressed into your, into your heart, heart until it catches fire. This is really the opposite of the Eastern religions. Christian meditation is filling your mind. In other words... What happens is, in that moment, what we believe as Christians is that the Word of God is a mediating form of God's presence. It mediates God's presence to us. When we come to the Word of God, we get the God of the Word. And so we hold that scriptural truth, roll it in our minds until it catches fire in our hearts. That's Christian meditation. So how will you meditate on God's Word in 2023? Well, first, you have to do that first part, the, the elimination piece. You eliminate some influence of the world. Your mind is a zero-sum game. You're going to fill it up with something. It's already full. What are you going to take away? Take something away and then, med- then put something in. Meditate on the Word of God. How do you do that? Here are some ideas. Here are some Bible. What, what I'm talking about right now, real practically, is Bible reading plans. Here are some ideas for 2023 for you to read God's word. Pray through the Psalms. You've heard us talk about that, I think, a couple years now. That has been really helpful for me, just to take one Psalm a day or even just a part of a Psalm a day and pray it through. D.A. Carson, 
uh, a theologian, a pastor. He has a devotional that's on the Gospel Coalition app. It's free. It has a reading plan attached to it and then a little devotional piece on a passage of scripture that you will read. There's a CBR journal. You've heard us talk about this in the past. CBR is Community Bible Reading. It does have a community aspect to it. It has a cool journaling part to it too. It's now called Seeing Jesus Together Journal. Um, I've heard good things about that. I'm, I'm debating whether or not to use it this year. And then there's some excellent devotionals out there. Tim Keller, John Piper, Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon all have great often free devotionals for you. Maybe you have something that you like. Here's my point. Get in the word. Meditate on God's word. One more thing. Kids. Kids, you're here, right? There was no kids class today, so I was thinking about you today. Kids, do you think that right now, when I talk about God's word, do you think I'm only talking to your mom and dad? I am definitely not. I'm talking to you. You need to be in God's word too. Talk with your mom and dad. After the service today, not right now, hang on. After the service today, talk to your mom and dad and come up with a realistic plan for what reading God's word might look like for you. Mom and dad, talk to your kids. Ask them afterwards, hey, what do you, what do you think? What would it look like for us to read the Bible in 2023? Maybe it's one verse. Maybe you memorize something together as a family. Maybe it's a a children's Bible, whatever it is. Talk together. In 2023, eliminate something influencing you from the world. Meditate on the law of God, on the word of God. And then finally we see this, the result of the resilient. So the enemies of of resilience, uh, the delight of the resilient, and now the result for the resilient. Verse three, he is like a tree planted by streams of water, that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The result for the resilient being in God's word is resilience. Fruit in season, never withering, perpetual prospering. And when judgment comes, down in the, down in the last verse, and it is coming, it's coming for all the world. When judgment comes, he or she will stand. This is all so good. And we know that. We read Psalm 1 and we think, yeah, happy, blessed, bearing fruit, big oak tree, that's me. Oh yeah, baby, that's what I want in 2023. Everything rhymes with 2023. It's great. But how do we cultivate the delight in God's word that it talks about? How do we really delight in it? I think we need to be honest for a moment. There's an, there's an obvious connection between God's word and this resilient, blessed, happy life. But meditating on the law of the Lord day and night probably sounds overwhelming or tedious or boring. How do you cultivate delight in the law of the Lord? And here's just what I would say. And there's a lot of different things out, written out there. But this is just what came to me as I was thinking about you all and about this passage. If you want to be the tree of Psalm 1, if you want to live that happy and blessed life, you have to take God's word personally. You have to take God's word personally. And if you take God's word personally, it's actually not a delightful thing at first. If we read the law of God, what we're going to find is that we fall far short. Adultery? Jesus said that if you, if you even look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery. Murder, Jesus said if you hate somebody in your heart, you've committed murder. We're not keeping the law of God. Tim Keller said, that's not delight, that leads to despair. So how can we delight in the law of God? How do we make God's word personal? How do we make it for us? Well, the answer is only through Christ. It's only through Jesus that God's word can truly become personal for us. Jesus makes God's word, God's promises, his law personal. It is for you. God's word is given for you. You to be blessed, you to be happy, you to bear fruit, you to prosper, you to stand in the judgment. We broke the law, all of us, 
Jesus took the punishment that we deserved so that instead of despairing when we read God's law that we would never measure up, we can never keep God's law, we can know that through faith in Jesus Christ, God delights in us. What a miracle. The promises are for us. So then the word of God becomes a delight. We don't stand outside of God's word as a condemned sinner looking at the blessings of God. We can take and read and delight that because Christ, it's all for us. It is for you. It's loving words from your Father. We are part. If you are in Christ, you are part of the blessing of Psalm 1. Blessed, happy are we because of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are part of an indestructible happiness and joy that can never be taken away from us. No matter how hard life gets, no matter how much sin we commit, we are in Christ and therefore we are in God and therefore the blessings of God are ours. And we bear fruit. It doesn't just, the blessing just doesn't stay in ourselves. We bear fruit. We become resilient, not on the basis of our own strength, but on the basis of the indestructible death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Often we see that resilience, this type of resilience that it talks about in Psalm 1, we see it shine most brightly against dark backgrounds. I wanted to close with two examples. At the beginning I started with that guy Daniel Neari talking about his mom Seema. And he was talking about his mother's resilience and he said this. So this is Daniel, the son, talking about his mom. He said, the legend of my mom is that she can't be stopped. It sounds like a tree planted by streams of water, doesn't it? The legend of my mom is that she can't be stopped. Not when you hit her, not when a whole country full of goons puts her in a cage, not even if you make her poor and try to kill her slowly in the little by little poison of sadness. I think she can't be stopped because she's fixed her eyes on something beyond the rivers of blood to a beautiful place on the other side. How else would anybody do it? The promises of God, the promise of a forever home through Christ are hers. She fixes her eyes on that and resilience comes. She's a tree planted by those streams. I recently finished a book called The Hiding Place. Many of you know that book. It's an excellent book. It's intense. I wouldn't necessarily re recommend it to young kids. Um, it's a story of the Ten Boom family, a Christian family in the Netherlands who joined the underground to resist Nazi occupation and rescue Nazis during World War II. They re I'm sorry, what did I say? Resist the Nazis, rescue Jews during World War II. I think that's what I said, I hope. Anyway, that's the right way to say it. Eventually, the family's captured and sent to a concentration camp. And the author, Corey, Corey Ten Boom, and her sister, Betsy, um, come to an extremely horrific, um, terrible situation. You guys have read many of the stories about concentration camps. Their daily life is they wake up extremely early, um, extremely cold, they work all day with back-breaking labor, they're barely fed, and they finally make their way back to the barracks where they sleep, it's infested with fleas, packed to the brim with people on multiple levels of bunks. Now miraculously, and this is another story for another time, they had smuggled a Bible into the concentration camp. And every night, in those flea-infested, super-packed barracks, after a night, a day of back-breaking labor and unbearable cold, they would open up their Bible under the light of a single dangling light bulb, and they would have a time in those barracks of prayer and Bible reading. And this is the way they describe it. This is Corey's description. They were services like no others, these times in barracks 28. Betsy or I would open the Bible and would translate it from Dutch, which is their native language, to German. And then we would hear the life-giving words passed back along the aisles of the bunk beds in French, Polish, Russian, Czech. They were previews of heaven, these evenings underneath the light bulb. I would know again 
that in darkness, God's truth shines most clear. This, this is, these are just examples of what the resilient life looks, on earth, looks like on earth. In the story that Jesus told at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, one man builds his house in the sand, and the other man builds his house on the rock. What is the rock? The rock, if you want to build your life so that it lasts, the rock to build your life on is the teaching of Jesus, the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, if you build your life on the Word of God, you will stand the tests of life. You will weather the storms. You will shine in the darkness. Do not build your, your life on anything else. So let's pray and pursue in 2023 more of God's word in me. Let's pray. Lord, help us in 2023 to have more of your word in us. We, we lay our lives before you and we ask, Lord, what is it that needs to be eliminated from our lives? Show us by the power of your spirit. And Lord, help us to meditate, help us to grab hold of a truth and for it to come into our heart in such a way that it catches fire, that we experience your presence. And we just praise you, Lord Jesus, that all these promises, the word, the very word of God is true and it is for us because we are in you. We are so thankful for this. Help us, Lord, to shine as lights, to stand like trees, to be a resilient people. In Jesus' name, amen.